Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Shanian. I'm a sheep and goat specialist with University of Maryland Extension. Maryland is a state in the, on the East Coast in the United States. My university is right next to Washington, D.C., but I have an office that's about an hour and a half away, depending on the traffic. I work at a research center. In the picture behind me, you can see, um, you can actually see the research center. This was a picture of a, a goat project we actually did for about 11 years. Uh, we were trying to identify goats that were more resistant to internal parasites. And speaking of internal parasites, that is what I am going to talk to you about today. So the theme of these videos is doing more with less. And I'm gonna address that topic from the standpoint of internal parasites, how we can most economically manage this problem or potential problem. So the first thing that we need to appreciate is that internal parasites, we call them different things. We call them gastrointestinal parasites. We call them nematodes. We call them worms. Regardless of what we call them, they are the primary health problem of sheep and goats, particularly those that are raised in a moist climate, a moist climate with rain and humidity, or even in a drier climate, uh, if we irrigate during the rainy season or if a drought breaks. So anytime we get that moisture and we have that warmth, there's a lot of different parasites that can infect sheep and goats. But the primary one is one that we call the barber pole worm. It's the largest of the stomach worms. Uh, the official name is Homonchus contortus. It's a problem for many reasons, but one of the reasons is because it's the biggest killer. It's the most pathogenic. It's the one that's most likely to cause problems when they get infected. And if that's not bad enough, what's happened over the years is the worms not just the barber pole worm, but especially the barber pole worm have developed resistance to the dewormers or the drugs that we use to control them. So what are parasites costing you in your sheep operation? How are they costing you money? I'm gonna divide your animals into three groups. The first group is the ones that show clinical signs of parasites. You know, they're not only are they infected, but they they are sick. They're having some impact. The next group is subclinical. They have parasites and they are affecting them, but we don't really necessarily see it. And the third group is the animals that are really not infected with uh, very high levels. You could do a fecal on them and they might have some eggs, but they're not really, they don't have very many and they're not really affecting them. So let's talk about the clinical animals, such as the one you see here in the picture. This is when we see obvious signs of parasites, anemia or blood loss. That's the primary symptom of barber pole worm. Bottle jaw, when you get an accumulation of fluid under the jaw. And then kind of more generic symptoms, like there's certainly worms that cause scours or diarrhea. Uh, all of them can cause a loss of weight and body condition. They can reduce their appetite, they can cause them to be very lethargic. You can kind of see that lamb in the picture is there. And so the primary cost of clinical parasitism can simply be death. You know, this lamb, I, I remember this lamb, it did indeed die. Sometimes we just find them dead. Uh, barber pole wormers can act very fast, particularly on young lambs, so death loss. But also production loss, like you see in, in this picture, the lamb's lost weight, it's lost body condition. If it survived, it would take longer to get to market. It would take more feed to get to market. Uh, if wool was an issue, it could cause a break in the wool. It could affect wool quality and quantity. It can affect milk production in the ewe. And it can reduce the immunity to, of that animal and make it more susceptible to other diseases. And then there's also the treatment costs. What do the drugs cost and what's your labor cost, both to monitor your animals and to administer treatments? So clinical parasitism can be a big cost in your operation. So we look at the next ones, which are the subclinical parasitism. We don't see obvious signs, but they're probably eating less, growing slower, 
taking longer to get to market, not in as good body condition, not as good wool production, not as much milk production. And again, a compromise on immunity. It takes, uh, when sheep are infected with parasites, they mount an immune response. And that nutrition goes to immunity instead of to growth and milk and things like that. And again, it, it can affect their ability to uh, resist other diseases. And once again, the treatment costs, the cost of the drugs and the cost of the labor to both monitor and treat those animals. The third group are the healthy animals, the ones that are not clinical. The parasites, if, if they're there, they're at very low levels or they're having no effect on health and productivity. How does that cost you money? Well, in many cases, we're deworming these animals. These de this deworming is unnecessary for these animals. We have the same treatment costs that we have with those other animals, the cost of the drugs and the cost of labor to monitor and treat those animals. We're preventing these animals, particularly the young ones from developing immunity. And by deworming animals that don't need it, we are contributing to this problem of the worms becoming resistant to the drugs because we're unnecessarily exposing those worms to drugs. And some of those worms are surviving treatment and cannot be treated with that drug when that animal might truly need treatment. So deworming healthy animals is a cost of parasitism. So what we now recommend, and this has changed from what it was when I was young, we don't recommend that you treat everybody. We don't recommend that you treat on some sort of calendar basis or regular basis. Now we have this term targeted selective treatment. And I'm gonna say also non-treatment. So it's treating the animals that need deworm when they need it and treating the ones that would benefit most from treatment and leaving some animals untreated. This reduces the number of animals that need deworm, so it reduces cost. It reduces the amount of dewormer that we use. It increases what we call refugia. And those are worms that have not been exposed to the dewormer. Thus, they remain susceptible to future treatment. So if you deworm this animal and 10% of the worms survive, those 10% are resistant to that drug and they'll go on to breed with other worms and make more resistant worms. You don't treat this sheep and all of the worms in her are still susceptible to the drug and will go on to produce those kinds of worms. So by selectively treating or selectively not treating animals, we're going to prolong the effectiveness of our dewormers and we're going to delay the development of resistant worms. Resistance is inevitable, much like it was in antibiotics. It's just a matter of how long it takes. And so we want to do things that slow the development of resistant worms. So then how do we know when to treat an animal and which animal to treat? And there's several decision-making tools for making these deworming decisions. I'm gonna go through each one of these, the FOMACHA system, the five-point check, performance, and then maybe some other criteria or other uh, combination of factors that you might use to make this decision. The FOMACHA system was developed here where you live in South Africa. It was developed by scientists and it was developed because of the growing uh, problem with drug resistance. As you can see from the picture, it's a card with, that shows the color of the animals or the membranes in the lower eyelid. And it's used to assess the level of anemia in the animal. So anemia is blood loss, the percent of red blood cells in the blood, that's the symptom of barber pole worm infection and also liver flukes cause anemia. And it's the primary cause of anemia in sheep. It's not the only one, but there's a good chance if your animal's anemic, unless it's severely malnourished, it's probably the barber pole worm. And so this card is gonna help assess that level of anemia and therefore help you make the decision on whether that animal needs to worm. This slide kind of summarizes it all. You can see the FOMACHA card. The one on the right is when it first came out, it was a fairly large card, but it's pretty good for, for showing you what's on the card. The picture in the upper left shows you what you're doing. You're going to look at the, lower, the color of the membranes in that lower eyelid. So the card has five colors, five categories, one, two, three, four, and five. And, each, and then it makes a treatment or a deworming recommendation. So each of those scores or colors was actually 
uh, correlated to a PAC cell volume. So a PAC cell volume is a blood hematocrit, the percent of red blood cells in the blood, in whole blood. And truly that's the actual diagnostic test for whether an animal needs dewormed for the barber pole worm, not a fecal test, but actually a blood test. And so the card correlates to those values and it comes up with deworming recommendations based on those values. So when the animal's lower eyelid is, is red or, or kind of a pinkish red, uh, it has a very high, it has a high pack cell volume. And unless you see some other reason, there's no reason to deworm that animal. Conversely, if the color of those lower eyelids is white or kind of a really pale pink, you can see they have much lower pack cell volume and you're gonna to want to deworm those animals. The tricky ones are the threes. When it's like a pink color, um, you can see there's a question mark because there are different recommendations. Usually some different criteria uh, helps you make that decision. So that one's a little bit different and it depends on some other factors. But clearly the one and two are not anemic and don't need treated and four and five clearly are and you need to make sure you deliver an effective drug. Another system is called the five point check. This was developed by the same researchers in South Africa. It's a follow up to the FAMACHA system because it addresses the limitations of the FAMACHA system. The FAMACHA system is only for parasites that feed on blood, such as the barber pole worm and liver flukes. And other parasites can affect sheep and, and goats. And they can cause other symptoms like scours uh, or uh, nasal discharge as in nasal lots. So this system broadens the FAMACHA system to include five different places that you check on the animal to make the worming decisions. I find that it can also help me decide whether or not to deworm that animal that has a FAMACHA score of three, that, that pink color. And a lot of times animals, especially goats, are, are very often right at that FAMACHA 3. So this table shows you the five checkpoints. So no, nest, no specific order, but one is the eye. So we're looking for the FAMACHA score. We're looking for that anemia. We score it one through five. Another one is the back, and we feel for body condition score. Uh, typically, we score between one and five using half scores, where one would be a very emaciated animal and five would be a very obese animal. Three would be one average. You could use a scale one through nine, and you it would be very similar. You just wouldn't use half scores. The next place we look at is the tail or the hindquarters. Here, we're looking for evidence of diarrhea for scours. We're looking, uh, dag, of course, is just wool with manure attached to it, so it's evidence of scours. And so we sometimes call it a, a, a DAG score. We score it zero to five. Sometimes the scale varies. Uh, and the scale goes up depending on how much uh, feces is covering their hind cores. We look at the jaw to see if they have bottle jaw. That's that swelling underneath the jaw. And the fifth point is the nose. And we're looking for a nasal discharge to see if that animal needs uh, treated for the nasal uh, bots or the bot fly. And you can see under possibilities that the worms that we're now assessing that animal for, it's a much uh, bigger group of what we're assessing it for. So this system, and it helps us make decisions for more than just the barber pole worm. Uh, this is a chart from South Africa from Dr. Garrett, Gareth Bath, and it just shows you some of the decision-making tools that we have for looking at the five point check. And the whole idea is to look at all these things together to make a deworming decision. An animal in poor body condition isn't necessarily one that's parasitized. There could be other things, same thing with scours, but it's looking at all these things collectively to make that decision. In order to get a FAMACHA card, you need to be trained. And they wanna make sure you know how to use the technique properly, make sure you score that eye properly. So you can get training on FAMACHA and the five point check in South Africa. Again, both of these systems, both of these decision-making tools were developed in South Africa. And there's an email down in the lower left corner, basically it's FAMACHA system at gmail.com. You can get training through rural veterinarians and other trained persons. So 
uh, send an email there if you're interested in getting trained. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic in the US, we started offering online uh, FAMATRA certification. Uh, basically, you watch a video, a presentation, you take a quiz, you have to get a passing grade, I think 70%, and then you make a video of you doing FAMATRA scoring. And if you do it properly, you get certified. You got to do the scoring proper. Uh, it's very important not to pull down on the eyelid, but we have this, this slogan called cover, push, pull, pop. So you cover that top eyelid, pull down or push on that eyelid. And then as you pull down, those membranes pop out. And we have videos of that. But if you were in a real bind and you wanted to take an online training, we do have them available in the U.S. But I would encourage you to try to get training in South Africa. Again, this is where these systems were developed. Another uh, criteria that can be used to make deworming decision is to look at performance. Uh, in Europe and New Zealand, they developed a, a system called the Happy Factor. Uh, and this was for areas where barber pole worm really wasn't the predominant parasite. It was the ones that caused scours, uh, like uh, nematodirus and um, in cooler, wetter climates. And what they do is they, they establish target weights for the lambs and if that, or calf. And if that lamb fails to reach that target weight, uh, it gets dewormed. And then if it meets its target weight, it does not. So similar philosophy is for matcha, but it uses weight. And it uses a much more kind of sophisticated model to come up with that. Then you can use average daily gain. We have producers in the US who do that. They typically combine it with a FAMACHA score. Uh, same thing we see like in Mexico and, and tropical climates is they use both rate of gain and FAMACHA. We do that at our research center. It's not sophisticated like the happy factor, but we do put rate of gain into our decision-making criteria. In Europe, they've, they've looked at uh, deworming dairy goats that are simply the highest producers, understanding that they're in the highest amount of stress. Same thing with uh, deworming based on the number of offspring. Obviously a ewe that has three or more offspring, she has much more production stress and is more likely to become parasitized. So focusing deworming on her. In fact, there was a Canadian study done a few years ago that came up with this set of criteria for deciding when to deworm a uh, parapartrid ewe. And what I mean by parapartrid, that means around lambing time. So kind of a couple weeks before up to about eight weeks after, that's when she's uh, at risk. And so if the ewe had a FAMACHA score of four or five, she would be dewormed. If her body condition score was two or below, she would be dewormed. If she had three or more offspring, you could either scan to see if you had that many, or if you don't scan simply when she gives birth, um, you can do that. And then they focus too on the, on the first time moms, the yearlings, um, giving them a treatment as well. So if they met one or more of those criteria, if you had a you that had a FAMACHA score of three, she had twin lambs and she used a body condition score of three, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do, and she was three years old, you wouldn't deworm her. You wouldn't deworm her. So the main thing is to, to try to just treat the animals that need it, but maybe even more importantly, finding some that don't need treatment. And that way you can keep worms uh, on the farm that are still susceptible to the deworming. Now, none of these systems work, whether you're selectively treating or blanket treating, unless the drugs work, unless you're able to deliver effective treatments. And as I already mentioned in the first slide, uh, dewormer resistance is a problem. And dewormer resistance, it's different than the animal having some resistance to worms. This is the worm having resistance to the drug. And it's an heritable trait that's passed on to the next generation of worms. It's the ability of that worm to survive a normally effective dose of dewormer. So you gave it the proper dose according to the label, you got all the drug uh, in the animal, it didn't spit any out, but worms survived that treatment. The first reports of dewormer resistance were in 1964, so that's more than 55 years ago. So this is a problem that started a long time ago. Again, it was inevitable. It just, how long was it gonna take? How long was it gonna take? And we've now reached a point where we have 
multiple dewormer resistance worldwide on sheep and goat farms. Uh, farms aren't just resistant to one dewormer, uh, the worms are resistant to multiple dewormers and multiple classes of dewormers. At the same time, it's important to understand that resistance does vary by farm. In the US, it's significantly different based on geographic region and based on climate. In our Southeast, so below Maryland, uh, we have much higher levels of resistance because the parasite challenge is much more significant. So animals have had to be dewormed with much more frequency, which means resistance is much higher. As we go North, so above Maryland uh, and out West where it's dry, they still have resistance issues, but not nearly what we have in our moist, humid climates. So it varies. Uh, we can have farms, however, in our dry climates that are irrigated, uh, they can have a lot of resistance. And then from an individual farm standpoint, it depends on what kind of practices you've had. If you constantly deworm and deworm a lot and deworm all the animals, you're much more likely to have resistance than somebody who either hasn't needed to deworm or has dewormed much more sparingly. So how do you determine which dewormers work on your farm? This is something every sheep and goat farm needs to know. We do what's called the fecal A count reduction test. So we're trying to compare fecal egg counts or wor uh, worm egg counts before treatment and after treatment. So we deworm them, collect a fecal sample, and then 10 to 14 days later, we collect a second one and we compare them. We want to do 10 or more animals for each drug. We don't need to check for all drugs at once. We should do need to sample the same animals each time. And we either need enough animals or high enough egg counts. You could probably do fewer than 10 animals if you had higher egg counts. And if you had low egg counts, you'd probably need to do more. We always say at least 250 eggs per gram of feces. You, can, you don't have to do 10 or 15. You can compile them into a, a composite or pooled sample. You need to follow the directions for how to do that. You don't just put your poop together, but you take so much from each sample. That can save time and that can save money. If that fecal A count is not reduced by 95% or more, then you have resistance to that dewormer. When it gets below 80%, you have pretty significant resistance. And as you get below 60%, chances are that drug is no longer going to be effective as a sole treatment if you were to give it to an animal that is clinically parasitized. So resistance starts at a very, 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 very low percent, and then it just keeps getting bigger. And you know we've had 55 years of uh, you know adding to that resistance, and so um, you know again it, it varies by farm. You you can work with your veterinarian to do these fecal egg count reduction tests. Uh, if you want to save money, uh, we teach people in the U.S. to to how they could do it themselves. Um, we have a shortage of veterinarians that work with small ruminants, so a lot of times we have to teach producers how to do things. Um, doing it yourself is not that hard and not that expensive. Um, you need a microscope, not a real expensive one, what I call a student microscope. You need a mechanical stage. That's just a little stage that moves that slide back and forth. That would make it easier. You need a special slide. You can see that slide in the lower right corner. That's called a McMaster slide. Uh, that uh, helps you count those eggs. You need a flotation solution. The eggs will sink in water and we need something that'll make the eggs rise to the top of the slide. You can make a flotation solution out of a saturated sugar or salt. So you can do that. You need something to weigh the feces, either a scale that weighs in grams, like a kitchen scale or a very inexpensive scale you can, you can buy online. Or you can actually use a large syringe, syringe and kind of determine weight by displacement. You need paper and plastic cups. You need a measuring cup or syringe. You need something to smash the feces. You need something to strain the feces and you need something to transfer the solution into that slide. So those are the things you need. It's pretty simple process. You collect a sample. Um, ideally you collect it directly from the animal. You put a glove on your hand, you put lubricant on and you collect it from the rectum. You can use a, uh, uh, feces that have been deposited on the ground, long as they're fresh, not contaminated, and you know which animal they came from. Uh, then again, then you weigh the sample. 
A fecal egg count is based on the weight of the feces and the volume of the flotation solution. Those are the two key um, pieces of information. So you put the sample in a cup, smash it up with your tongue depressor, you add flotation solution. The amount that you add depends on the weight of the feces. You mix that solution, let it soak. After five minutes, you strain the solution into another cup. You can use a tea strainer, you can use gauze, you can use cheesecloth. And then you fill the chambers of the slide with the solution. So it's not a flat slide. It's got chambers that you can put liquid in it. Sometimes you have to practice doing that because you don't want to get any air bubbles. Then you wait five minutes to give the eggs a chance to rise to the top, no more than an hour. And you read the slide. You count all the eggs in the slide, in, in the grid, count both sides. And then you multiply it by either 25 or 50, depending on how many feces you have. And you can see this picture kind of shows you what you'll be looking at under the microscope. You have the line. So those two eggs are inside the grid and you can, um, and that's what you'll be looking at. And you get what's, you get a gram eggs per gram of feces. Besides using egg counts to determine um, the fecal egg count reduction test and determining dewormer resistance, you can also use fecal egg counts to monitor pasture contamination and probably could do a pooled sample and you could do that from random animals. You wouldn't need to know specific animals. You can also use fecal egg counting to identify the animals on your farm that are more resistant to parasites or more susceptible. And uh, that's one of the, finding those animals, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, is one of the best ways to control parasites, certainly in the long run. Okay, now let's talk about controlling parasites without the drugs or with less dewarming. I think for most of us, I don't care whether it's an antibiotic, a coccidiostat, or a dewormer, we'd all like to raise our animals with fewer of those inputs, both from a cost standpoint, but also from a, a public acceptance standpoint. So I'm gonna talk about some of these things, everything from pasture and grazing to common sense about how we can reduce our use of these drugs, which should save us money and make our animals more productive. All right, pasture is the vector of transmission for worms. That's how they get infected. So it makes sense that control relies in that area. Sheep get infected when they ingest the third stage larva. And for today's presentation, we've, I've mostly been talking about what we would call roundworms or stomach or um, strongyles. Those are the type of worms that we're talking about. They all have a very similar life cycle. Uh, it, it has no intermediate host, and they, when they poop, the egg hatches. Uh, the egg then uh, goes from first stage larva to third stage larva, and all that happens on pasture. Then the sheep ingest that third stage larva, and once inside the sheep, that third stage larva will develop into an immature worm, which will start sucking blood, but it doesn't lay eggs, and then it develops into an adult worm, which not only lays eggs, but sucks blood and then it poops eggs out and then the cycle keeps going round and round. And so parasites are primarily a numbers game. Most of the parasites are out on pasture. Then we have parasites inside of the animal. Uh, things like, you know, it's how much they're exposed to. So some of these things that we can in reduce the sheep ingesting this infective larva is to reduce the length of time that they stay on a pasture. We talk about moving them every three to four days in the US. Not saying everybody does that, but we talk about that because that's about the shortest amount of time in our climate that the egg that she just deposited will become an infected third stage larva. So that's the quickest she can get reinfected on a pasture. So reducing the length of stay, maybe not as short as three or four days, but the shorter, the better. Reducing stocking rates. Again, it's a numbers game. Fewer sheep means fewer eggs means fewer larva. Increasing the pasture rest periods, allowing that pasture to rest for a longer period of time. The larva will die off. It dies off um, quicker when it's hot and dry than when it's cooler or than when it's wetter and cooler. So the more longer we can rest, the more eggs die off. 
If we alternate grazing between small ruminants, sheep and goats share the same parasites, but they mostly don't with the other species. There's a little cross transmission with cattle, but none with horses. If we alternate, that's equivalent to resting that pasture. If I've got, if I've got horses on that pasture, that's essentially resting it for small ruminants. Don't graze the pastures too short. Most of the infected larva is in the first two or three inches. It doesn't go that far out and up. I mean, there are extreme cases, but on average, most of it's in that first couple of inches and it's gonna stay close to the moisture. Avoid hot spots on pasture. Uh, leaky, an area where there's a leaky water can be, there can be a lot of parasites in that area. A, what I call a grass pen. People think they have their animals in a dry lot situation, but there's grass growing in there. And that can be really risky because the animals are really gonna focus and eat that grass and there's not enough of it and it's short and it can be a real risky period. We always wanna put our most susceptible animals on our cleanest or least contaminated pastures. And that would be lambs, the wieners, and it would be those parapartrant ewes, primarily lactating ewes. And there is some opportunity to use alternative forages for grazing. There are plants that have condensed tannins in them. Uh, Cerisia lespedeza is a perfect example. It's a warm season legume. Animals grazing Cerisia lespedeza have fewer parasite problems. And there's probably some other examples in South Africa. Using nutrition to control parasites, well-fed animals mount a better immune response to parasites regardless of exposure level. Animals in poor body condition are at the other end of the spectrum and they are much more susceptible to the effects of parasites. They're gonna have problems with parasites at much lower levels of infection than a well-fed animal. Sometimes it's necessary to supplement pastures um, to reduce the impact of parasitism. And because the, the barber pole worm uh, causes blood and protein loss. Uh, protein supplementation has been shown to be most effective. They've shown that feeding ewes in late pregnancy can reduce their fecal egg counts, particularly with bypass protein. So body condition scoring is something that we should do on a regular basis. It helps us to manage the health and nutrition of our animals. I've alluded to this already, the parrot partridge egg rise. So that parrot partridge ewe two weeks before lambing up to eight weeks after. She suffers a temporary reduction in immunity to parasites. The result is a high, higher fecal egg count. And that higher fecal egg count, if she's on pasture, will contribute to pasture contamination and it will be the primary source of infection for her offspring that will either graze alongside her or graze after her. So it's a, even if she's not clinical, it's a source of pasture contamination. So we need to have a method or a strategy for managing that increased egg count. The traditional strategy was to deworm use in late pregnancy. That's still a good strategy, but we shouldn't do all of them. We should do that targeted selective treatment. Remember the Canadian study, Fomacha four or five, body condition two or less, three or more lambs, than a yearling or first time mom. So this you right here, you can tell without touching her that she's in good body condition. She probably just has that one lamb. There would be no reason to treat her. Keeping ewes in confinement. And every time I write the word confinement, I write zero grazing because that's what it means. It, do, it doesn't mean some grass in there, it means no grazing. We can keep her in during that time. I already mentioned we can increase the level of protein in her late gestation ration especially bypass protein. I can't speak for when this would be, but you can lamb at a time of the year when parasites are less active. We have a lot of folks that lamb in the winter time uh, in, in, in the Midwest and in Maryland because the parasites aren't active. The fall is a real nice time to uh, lamb in the US if only the sheep were a bit more cooperative in terms of out of season breeding. And you can manage ewes according to the number of lambs they've had. I've seen some research in, in England where they, they, they scan them and then they split them into management groups in terms of not only nutrition, but also how they're going to manage parasites. So they may increase the ration for the triplet ewes, 
not only because they have triplets, but also because they're more susceptible to parasites. I've already alluded to this using genetics to control internal parasites. Uh, you can raise or cross with the more resistant breed. This is pretty big in the US. Increasingly, people are turning to hair sheep because of them having higher resistance to parasites. When we look at our genetics in our flock, we need two philosophies. We need to select the best rams and call the worst ewes. And this goes for parasites too. Select the rams that have the lowest FAMACHA scores, the ones that don't need treated, and the ones that have the lowest fecal egg counts if you have access to that information. If not, use your FAMACHA score to estimate resistance. We need to call the ewes that have the highest FAMACHA scores and the highest fecal egg counts. The only thing I'll say about this is be careful not to discriminate against the ewes that are raising multiple lambs because they would be expected to have higher fecal egg counts. So be careful as you implement getting the, rid of the ewes with the highest FAMACHA scores. Selection for parasites works because of what we call the 70-30 rule. 30% of the sheep in the flock are responsible for 70% of the fecal egg output. Find those animals and cull them. Find the, 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 you know, at least get rid of the worst ones. You can make progress in a flock. Parasite resistance that is quantified with fecal egg count is much more heritable than twinning. So you'll make much more rapid progress. You can use confinement, again, zero grazing, to control parasites, especially in susceptible animals. In the U.S., it's quite common for lambs, for ewes to go out on pasture, but lambs to never go out on pasture. And then they, the ewe, by the time she goes out on pasture, she's pretty resistant. And then the lambs are raised in dry lot or, or a feedlot, and they never have to worry about parasites. In confinement, worms are practically eliminated. You know, if that sheep has never been out, it does not have a source of infection. The parasites do not survive well in straw, in dirt, or on slatted floors. On the other hand, and I've already mentioned this, grass pens can be high risk, and coccidia, which is a protozoan parasite, can be more problematic because it's not transmitted on the forage, it's transmitted in the feces. If mama's got a dirty udder and the kid lamb sucks on that udder, it can get infected or a dirty feeder or something like that. There is usually no need to deworm animals that are raised in confinement. Again, no source of infection, no source of reinfection. Not for stomach worms, not for what we call worms, okay? When you do deworm, make sure you get the greatest possible impact. All oral treatments, it's now recommended that you give combination treatments for those that are clinically parasitized. Combination treatment is when you use dewormers that have different modes of action, dewormers from different chemical classes. In the US, we have to buy those dewormers individually in South Africa, it's possible that you have some combination products that are on the market. Very important not to underdose. We wanna make sure we dose on an accurate weight. If we're working with a group of animals and we don't want to fill the syringe separately, we wanna make sure we calibrate that gun for the heaviest animal in the group. We wanna make sure we calibrate our equipment so that we know that when we fill it up for 20 mils, that that's what they're getting. We want to properly drench. We don't want that dewormer being spit out. We want to handle the animals uh, with low stress, have good facilities and good restraint so that deworming is not a stressful event, particularly as those ewes get closer uh, to uh, lambing. We don't want to handle them too close to lambing. We do not want to mix products. If we are going to give a combination treatment using different drugs, we're going to need to give them separately unless we can buy them in a combination treatment. We wanna properly store any dewormer that we haven't used, and we don't wanna use product that is significantly past its expiration date. And my last thing is just to say, use your head. Anticipate problems. Consider your animals, consider which ones are at greatest risk, and I've already emphasized that's the pair of partridge use and the lambs that have been weaned. Consider the weather, 
warmth and moisture is what drives parasites. So if you've gotten a lot of that, anticipate problems. Consider your land. There are differences with slope of land, aspect of land in terms of uh, the risk. And consider the pasture itself, what species is growing, how much ground cover. A lot of different things can factor into the risk of parasites. It's not a simple problem. It's a complex problem. It's a thinking person's problem. And with that, I will conclude. It's been my pleasure to give this presentation. Um, I did have the pleasure of visiting South Africa in 2015. That's where some of the pictures that you saw were from. Some of them were from my farm as well. And uh, I hope that this information can help you uh, manage parasites in the most economical way possible. And I thank you.